Hello everybody, I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'm Axinia, as you might know, and I would like to welcome you to another super high yield antibiotics video. Today we will be discussing the cephalosporins. The most difficult thing about this group is that there are just too many of the cephalosporins. We have five classes and all of the drugs sound pretty much the same. So what you can do is Google some mnemonic if you like, pick whichever suits you the most and move on. That's the easy part. What is important for me to teach you in this video is not how to memorize the drugs, but how to use them to treat patients. The information in this video will be equally helpful to your USMLEs exams and your daily clinical practice. So let's get started. So let's start from the very beginning real quick so we have a structure. This is the classification of the antibiotics in regards to bactericidal and bacteriostatic effect. On the USMLEs they like asking you these questions, especially on step 1 and step 3, which antibiotic is bactericidal and which is bacteriostatic, that's how they will catch you because most of the time we forget which one is what, right? Uh, as you can see here, the bactericidal antibiotics are the aminoglycosides, stephosporins, fluoroquinolones, metronidazole, penicillins, carbapenems, astronum and vancomycin. And the bacteriostatic antibiotics are the clindamycin, horamphenicol, macrolides, linezolid, tetracyclines and TMP, SMX. They're mostly bacteriostatic, but there is a certain controversy as to whether they have bactericidal effect too. But remember, they're mostly bacteriostatic. Here's a quick recap of the mechanism of action of our antibiotics. For super detailed information about the mechanism of action, you can refer to my video uh, dedicated specifically on antibiotics mechanism of action and you can also see click on the link that you see on the screen on the right upper corner so it can take you directly to that video but overall right it is very simple our antibiotics target three things the cell wall which supports the structure of the bacteria as you all know and protects it from lysis the ribosomes where the proteins are synthesized and the dna our cephalosporins here, they target the bacterial cell wall and they are bactericidal. As you can imagine, right? As once the cell wall is destroyed, the bacteria dies. There is no other option for the bacteria. There is no plan B. So once the bacterial cell is damaged, destroyed, the bacteria will die. That's why the cephalosporins are bactericidal antibiotics. Now, if you start reading about the cephalosporins, it is an ocean of information. It can be simultaneously overwhelming and quite boring. So we're going to make this short, sweet and fun. The only way, in my opinion, to remember these medications is to put them into clinical context. Currently, you might be studying for an exam, but you will need this knowledge during your residency. During residency, trust me, every day will be an exam day. And at the end of the day, it is not about a score, it's about human life. So always treat every patient like it's your family member or it will, if it were you, right? Like you were treating yourself. Strive to know it all. Most of the times it's not possible, of course, but trying will make a difference in your life and in your patient's lives. So here you can see the first generation cephalosporins. The most commonly used ones are the cephalexin and cefazolin. They are active against most gram-positive cocci, except for the enterococci, oxacillin-resistant staphylococci and penicillin-resistant pneumococci. They are very commonly used to treat skin infections, the cellulitis especially, and they are also active against most strains of E. coli, Proteus mirabilis and Klebsiella pneumonia. The cephalexin and cephazolin, in this case for gram-negative coverage, they are mostly commonly used for UTI. And before we move on to the second generation of cephalosporins, let's take a quick second here to remind ourselves which organisms were gram-positive and gram-negative because we will be using them a lot during this video. You can of course pause the video and uh, just uh, refresh your memory properly, but just a quick recap, the gram-positives are the staphylococci, which are staph aureus, staph epidermidis and staph saprophyticus. 
the, we have streptococci and also gram positive. We have alpha hemolytic ones, which are strep pneumo and strep viridans. The beta hemolytic ones are strep pyogenes and strep agalactiae. And the gamma hemolytic ones are the enterococci and strep gallolyticus, previously known as strep boys. And the gram positive rods are Clostridium, Corinobacterium, Listeria, Bacillus anthracis, Bacillus cereus, Nocardia, and Actinomyces. And here are the gram negative organisms. We have divided them into Diplococci, Coxoid rods, and rods. The Diplococci are the Neisseria meningitidis, Neisseria gonorrhea, Moraxella, and Veilonella. The coxoid rods are Haemophilus influenzae, Bordetella, Pertussis, Brucella, and Pasturella. And the gram negative rods are the E. coli, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, Serratia. And those are the lactose fermenting ones. And the lactose non fermenting ones are H. pylori, Salmonella, Shigella, Proteus, and, and Pseudomonas. Alright, so we're moving on to cephalosporin second generations. The most commonly used antibiotics here are the cephaloxin, cefoxidin, and cefotetan. They mostly have anaerobic coverage, they have better gram-negative coverage than first generation and they have absolutely the same gram-positive coverage as first generation. They are most commonly used to treat intra-abdominal and pelvic infections. Cefuroxim especially is more active than cefazulin against H. influenzae and may be useful in treating otitis, sinusitis and respiratory tract infections. Whereas cefoxidin and cefotetan, again like the first generation, they're active against E. coli, Proteus mirabilis and Klebsiella. From the cephalosporins third generation, we have ceftazidim and ceftriaxon. They have no anaerobic coverage in comparison to second generation when they had anaerobic coverage. But they have better gram-negative coverage, especially for Neisseria gonorrhea, Enterobacter and Serratia. Ceftazidim here is especially useful for meningitis and pneumonia caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Remember, ceftazidim for Pseudomonas. Ceftriaxon, you will be using it a lot in your clinical practice. It's very commonly used for community acquired pneumonia. Also for penicillin resistant gonorrhea, Lyme disease of the CNS or joints, meningitis due to ampicillin resistant H. influenzae and meningitis in children, UTI, pyonephritis, acute diverticulitis. <clears throat> for acute diverticulitis, remember to add metronidazole to cover for the anaerobes because again, the third generation cephalosporins have no anaerobic coverage. And an interesting side effect of the ceftriaxone is formation of biliary sludge composed of ceftriaxone crystals, causing the syndrome of biliary pseudolatiasis. And from the fourth generation cephalosporins, we have the cefepim or cefepime. We call it the big gun because it has very broad spectrum. It is as active as the first generation for gram-positive coverage and as active as third generation for gram-negative coverage. Unfortunately, it has no anaerobic coverage, but it's basically combining all positive effects from the first generation and the third generation. It has similar activity to cefotaxim and ceftriaxone against pneumococci and MSSA, which is methicillin sensitive staph aureus. And also, like third generation, it is active against the Enterobacteriaceae, Neisseria, and H. influenzae, but by the way, it has greater activity against Enterobacter. And also, super important thing, cefepim is as active as ceftazidim for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And another quick tip here, if you ever suspect pseudomonal infection, right, always start therapy with broad spectrum antibiotics and then you can de-escalate the therapy after the blood cultures come back and result. And remember the risk factor for pseudomonal pneumonia and infection include history of pseudomonal infection, IV antibiotics used in the past three months and especially nursing home patients. And from the fifth generation of the cephalosporins, we have the ceftarulin, which has anaerobic coverage like the second generation of cephalosporins. And it is the only one that covers MRSA, especially infections in the lungs, like community acquired pneumonia, skin and soft tissue infections caused by MRSA. Ceftarulin also has activity against vancomycin intermediate staph aureus, 
penicillin resistant pneumococci and enteric gram negative rods. And another super important few generation cefusporin is the ceftoluzane, which is used in combination with tazobactam, which is a beta lactamase inhibitor. And this combination ceftoluzane tazobactam is the most potent anti pseudomonal medication that we have out there. And also another interesting thing for the vancomycin resistant staph aureus the VRSA and the VRE which is the vancomycin resistant enterococcus we can use daptomycin IV or linezolid and remember linezolid we can use IV or PO and very important side effect is the cause of serotonin syndrome caused by linezolid because it causes decreased serotonin breakdown so remember, if you're ever using linezolid, be very careful if the patient is on any antidepressant like the SSRIs, right? And I would quickly like to mention Cefiderucol. This is another cephalosporin. It's called Cidero 4 cephalosporin. I'm not sure if you have heard about it, but it is very important because it is used for multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and also used for extended spectrum beta lactamase or carbapenemase producing organisms. Currently in US it is FDA approved for adults with complicated UTI and or pyonephritis due to highly resistant gram negative organisms when there are no alternative treatment regimens. And at the end let's summarize the cephalosporins the most important features about them. All of the cephalosporins achieve therapeutic levels in pleural, pericardial, peritoneal, like for example in spontaneous bacterial pleuronitis, especially cephotaxim or ceftriaxone, synovial fluids and urine. The first and second generation enter the CSF poorly, but luckily the third generation penetrate the CSF in patients with meningeal irritation. The oral third generation drugs are less active against enteric gram negative bacteria than the parenteral drugs and the oral second and third generations are used for otitis media, upper respiratory tract infections and UTIs. And remember the cephalosporins with anti pseudomonal coverage are the ceftazidim which was the third generation, cefepim fourth generation and the combination ceftoluzane tazobactam which is fifth generation cephalosporin. And lastly, what do we do if the patient is cephalosporin allergic? So these are the main things that you need to remember. If there is an allergy to cephalosporins in the past reported and now a patient requires a penicillin, what you should do is test for penicillin allergy first and then give penicillin. If the patient is allergic to cephalosporins with anaphylaxis, then don't give penicillin on cephalosporins, of course, right? It makes sense but you can give them fluoroquinolones or astronum. But remember, if the patient is specifically allergic to ceftazidim, do not give them astronum. Why? Because astronum and ceftazidim share an identical side chain and cross reactivity between the two drugs is, are, is reported. So don't use astronum if the patient is allergic to ceftazidim. And in patients with immediate cephalosporin allergy, then you can use one of the carbapenems, imipenem, silastadin, meropenem, ertapenem, or doripenem. All right, so this is the end of our cephalosporins video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and hopefully by now the cephalosporins make more sense to you. You will see that once you start practicing medicine in residency, you will be using the same medications, the same antibiotics more or less. For those of you who are studying for the USMLEs, good luck to you all, study every day, don't give up, be persistent, put in the time and you will see that the results will be excellent because no effort goes unrewarded, remember that. And for those of you who are in residency, just strive to be the best and good luck. See you on the next video.